I would say we are meeting or beating world standards here. We need to raise the standard of living of our country, and this is one way that we can do it. This is BC's coast, the latest battleground between environmentalists and the Canadian energy industry desperate to get its products overseas. But does shipping Canadian resources like oil through BC's waters really present an undue risk to the environment like activists claim? Is this really another Exxon Valdez waiting to happen? Or is it all just part of another distraction? Let's go get the facts. My name is Aaron Gunn and this is Politics Explained. At a glance, the Canadian energy industry is massive. Oil and gas alone contribute over $100 billion to the Canadian economy each year and support more than half a million jobs right across the country. But lately, the industry has been devastated. Unable to reach overseas markets, Canada has been forced to sell 98% of its oil at a discount to the United States, costing us billions and leading to layoffs across much of Western Canada. It's for this reason a series of pipelines to Canada's coasts were initially proposed. But a steady stream of activism and political interference have wreaked havoc ever since. This has left a single pipeline, the Trans Mountain Expansion, allowed to proceed. I met with Stuart Muir, the Executive Director of Resource Works, to talk about the importance of this project. How important is the Trans Mountain uh, pipeline expansion for Canada's energy industry? Yeah, you'll often hear it described as being for the benefit of oil companies or it's for Alberta. It really is a national project because what it will allow Canada to do is get full market value for its crude oil, which happens to be its number one export. So here we are exporting all this oil to the U.S., but they're getting it at a big, big discount. And that's wrong. It's wrong if you're an environmentalist who believes that resources have to be used to their fullest, most responsibly. It's also wrong economically. It's wrong in every sense. But fierce opposition remains, especially from BC's NDP government and activist groups like the Tiny House Warriors. These groups have argued that the construction of new pipelines will lead to an increase in dangerous tanker traffic off Canada's coast. And more often than not, they point to a single incident from 30 years ago to justify their argument, the Exxon Valdez oil spill. There are two eras in global oil tanker history, before Exxon Valdez and after Exxon Valdez. 1989 was when the ship uh, ran aground in Alaska and broke up. It was devastating, there's no question. The effects of it linger to this day. That's when around the world it was recognized that this was an intolerable situation. The effect that it had on safety was uh, thorough and complete. So we have double hull tankers, we have different types of pilotage, we know a lot more about um, drift and spill response technology. It would be a misnomer to think that we're only back at the time of the Exxon Valdez and nothing has changed. One of the most important changes was the introduction of new double-hauled vessels, which are now a requirement for all tankers operating in Canadian waters. Unlike the single-hauled Exxon Valdez, these tankers provide significant protection to the ship's hull and its cargo by insulating it with not one, but two watertight layers. Because of these and other changes, since the 1970s, the number of oil spills around the world have declined dramatically, even as tanker traffic has continued to increase. And while the advent of technological innovations like double hulls and GPS have proved vitally important to this achievement, it's also the skills and professionalism of the local pilots that count the most, such as those of the BC Coast Pilots and their president, Captain Roy Hawkinson. Well, we were incorporated in 1972 under the Pilotage Act in Canada. Our roots go back to 1850. You guys have probably been piloting tankers in and out of the Burrard Inlet here in Vancouver since the 1960s, since the original Trans Mountain Pipeline was built. Correct. Required by law, every deep sea vessel that approaches a Canadian port is boarded and piloted to its final destination 
by a locally trained pilot, or in the case of loaded tankers, a team of two. 24-7, day and night, in all weather conditions, the deep sea shipping that is coming into our ports and going out is under the conduct of a local professional expert and that'll be the British Columbia Coast Pilots. Uh, when the pilot goes to work, his mandate is to protect. We are out there every day and night yeah. doing this. But how do they get on to the ships? It's still done biblical in that we still use the pilot ladder. It's a rope ladder with wood, wood slats to it. I was fortunate enough to observe one of these boardings in action just off the southern tip of Vancouver Island. So we're here in Victoria, just off the coast. You can see the pilot boat right there. There is a local pilot on that ship with knowledge of the local waters and, and navigation channels and tides. And uh, they're going to board one of the incoming ships, whether it's a container ship, uh, a, a bulk ship, or uh, as the case may be, a tanker carrying uh, Canadian oil. The ship we first approached was the Panamanian flagged vessel, the Pan Poseidon a bulk carrier similar, if smaller, to the oil tankers that already transit these waters a couple times per week. It was off to Vancouver, presumably to pick up a shipment before heading to its next destination, Yan Tai, China. We're just outside of Victoria, where a local pilot is about to board this ship that's come from a foreign country and is gonna pilot it into Vancouver Harbor. This is what happens with all of the bulk carriers, the large container ships, and yes, the oil tankers too. There is always a local professional pilot navigating the ship through BC waters. In addition to requiring two Canadian pilots on board, tankers approaching or departing the port of Vancouver are also required to be escorted the entire way by a tugboat as an added level of redundancy against mechanical failure. But some activists believe that the quality of pilots such as Roy Hawkinson or the safety regime put in place are irrelevant. That's because, in their opinion, any risk of spill, no matter how small, presents an existential threat to the environment due to the nature of the tanker's contents, diluted bitumen or dilbit from Alberta. According to them, the heavy bitumen, unlike other oils, sinks directly to the ocean floor and proves impossible to clean up. But is that actually true? I met with Michael Lowry of the federally regulated Western Canada Marine Response Corporation to ask him that exact question. The fear initially from people was that when it spilt, the dilutant just kind of disappeared and it returned to a bitumen that sank. And that's not what happens. It's, it's a new product, diluted bitumen's a new product. And so when it spills, yeah, some light ends evaporate, but it still floats they did uh, spill simulations and they found it was actually easier to clean up Dilbit than it was to clean up even medium, lighter oils. You know, we often tell people actually it's not the tankers that keep us up at night. Uh, because there are uh, extra safety measures on tankers that don't exist with other vessels. So um, this whole thing around Dilbit that, you know, we're supposed to be, get, uh, uh, you know, all worried about this, it's, uh, it's just not grounded in fact at all. Despite the work of the BC Coast Pilots and others in industry, in May 2017, the Oil Tanker Moratorium Act was introduced into the House of Commons, effectively banning tankers off BC's north coast and torpedoing the most obvious path forward for Canada's oil to reach international markets. But what was the justification? Well, the Minister of Transport, Mark Garneau, cited the unique ecological sensitivity of oil spills to the region, despite the fact his own department concluded the exact opposite, that Northern BC presented the lowest risk just four years earlier. The decision to ban oil tankers up there was purely a political one, uh, nothing to do with local conditions whatsoever. And that's not just my opinion, that's what Transport Canada, it's what they found in a report they did a few years ago. Nothing stands out that would curtail uh, the North Coast being less safe than the South Coast. It's just political pressure, that's all it is. But to uncover an even more outrageous level of hypocrisy, I traveled to the Prime Minister's hometown of Montreal, and you won't believe what I happened to find. So we're here in Montreal, 
uh, Montreal East on the east part of the island. And you can see right over there, right behind me, is the crude oil tanker Laurentia de Gagne. It's a Panamax tanker. These are the largest tankers that can transit uh, the Panama Canal. And you can see it right in the middle of the St. Lawrence River. It's picking up crude oil from Alberta uh, via pipeline that terminates in Montreal up to the Quebec City refinery in Lévis. You can see it literally right there. Uh, there's no one has any concerns. It's just sitting in the middle of the river getting ready to moor. And uh, it just goes to show you how safe uh, these things really are. So how could the federal government justify banning tankers in one part of the country while allowing them to sail freely in another? To answer this question, I sat down with the fleet director for Transport des Gagnés, the operator of the ships in question, Dr. Philip John. Just over a year ago now, back in, back in 2019, Bill C-48 was passed by the current government, which uh, bans, basically bans tanker traffic off, off the coast of northern British Columbia. Is there a ecologically consistent and coherent argument in favor of such a ban? Or is it simply politics? I, I think it, it's politics and also the, the misinformation. We have an example here on the St. Lawrence River where we have had this operation going for the last four years. Let's look at the risk, let's look at how safe it has been and then apply those same principles to the West Coast. If it is successful here, why cannot be it be successful on the West Coast? So, is tanker traffic off BC's coast safe? Well, I suppose it depends on your perspective. Nothing is ever 100%, but when you compare it to literally any other jurisdiction in the world, there is simply no safer place to transport energy. Our pilots are second to none. Our maritime protocols are world class, and we've already been transporting oil safely for over 60 years. Activists have framed this as an issue, as they do so often, as one of the economy versus the environment. But it's a false choice. Canada doesn't need to compromise its ecological stewardship in order to get our resources overseas. We already can and do both. Um, it's so strict. There's really uh, so much accountability, so many safety nets. It's not one safety net, it's multiple. I mean, look, there was, there was a spill down in, uh, the, in Brazil that they didn't even uh, you know, try to clean up. They probably don't have safeguards that we have in Canada. So it'll be a lot more dangerous for the environment. It's a, uh, a layer of safety that's on top of many other layers of safety. In terms of marine shipping incidents, I believe there's zero. We have the resource here, we need to make you best use of that resource. And of course, at the same time, the profits uh, that we can generate can be used to support research and industry into other forms of energy, not just fossil fuels. Until next time, my name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been Politics Explained. <laughs>